Good morning, church. How's everyone this morning? Good to hear you all singing. It was so awesome to hear. So awesome to hear. Hey, why don't you go ahead and grab a copy of God's Word and turn to Acts chapter 3. I want to let you know that um, we changed up the order a little bit this morning. Change is good, right? Change is good. Change is good. And so uh, we do have a lot to share with you this morning announcement-wise, but I want to save it for after the message because I don't want to distract you from God's Word. That's the most important thing. And so it's coming Uh, We will not do music after the message because I want to spend time letting you know some incredibly awesome things that are coming in your church. So be prepared for that. So now's a good time to go potty if you need to, okay? Um, Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 23, that's where we're going to be this morning. Make sure you get your eyes on God's word. And we've been studying the book of Acts for a little while now, probably going to do it for well over a year. And uh, bless you, whoever that was. But we're going to just walk through it. Now, the whole story of the book of Acts really is not the super um, show gifts and, 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 and the miracles so much, but really it's the spreading, it's the using of those things to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And so the book of Acts actually tells the story of how Jesus gets that done. And so... um, Luke was the author, and Luke wrote a book beforehand, and anyone know the name of it? Luke. Awesomely smart guy right there. And, and Luke wrote this book, and in this first book that he wrote, he told about who Jesus is, right, and what he said, and what he taught, and what he did. And then the book of Acts, that's a response book. This is the second book that Luke wrote, and it is uh, how we should respond to who Jesus is and what he said and what he taught. Get it? You tracking with me on that? So so the book of Acts is interesting, though. The book of Acts is is true. It's it's chock full of of truth, right? There's all kinds of truth that is shared, but it's also an amazing example shown. Get it? Okay, lots of truth, lots of examples. So here's the deal. If we follow the examples that they show in Acts and share the truths that they shared in Acts, this is the part that should excite you, then we can see the results that we see in Acts. Okay? And that's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. Now, um, before we read the text this morning, I have to tell you that sometimes, let me see if you guys are with me. Sometimes when you read the Bible, do you ever read the Bible and, and you're like, Read it, and you get through, and then you read it again. It's like, yeah, nothing. I got nothing, God. I just, I heard nothing, right? It's like reading a Dr. Seuss book. Do you, anyone ever read the Bible and it just doesn't seem like to be alive to them that day? All the super holy people have their hand down, right? The rest of us normal mortals, right? But, but so, so sometimes you got to get in there, right, and you got to dig, 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 until finally you're, you're in a hole about eight foot deep, and you finally find a nugget. It's like, oh, there it is, right? We've been there. But sometimes you read the Bible, and the moment you put your, your, your shovel into the ground, you hit something right away, right? And it's like, boom, gold, right? A treasure chest right there. And you keep digging, there's another one, and there's another one, and there's another one, right? And it's like, boom, the floodgates are open, right? Anyone ever been there? Those are the good days, right? Those are the good days. Wish they were all those days, right? Not always that way. But this text right here, this is one of those. The moment you put your shovel in the dirt, you're going to hit the top of a treasure box. And as soon as you undo that one, take that one out, There's another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. So listen, I'm going to read this to you, but I have to tell you, I don't know if I want to apologize or not. I have a lot to share with you. We're going to be here a while, okay? Listen, this is not going to be your 30-minute sermonette, feel better, go home. Not happening today, okay? Who thinks I preach long? Raise your hand, I'm ashamed, okay, yeah. That's seven pages of notes. That's what I usually have every single week. Today I got ten. Okay? I can't help it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing about this text, right? You're going to read it here in a second. It's one story. It's one story. It's one story. And I tried and I tried and I tried to find a way to divide it up into like two weekends. 
And there's just no way to do that and, and be able to pass on the goodies here effectively. We could have. It could have been okay, but I don't want it to be okay. Anyone happy with okay? I'm not happy with okay. I'm happy with awesome, right? That's what I want every single time we come to church. And so I want to just pass on everything that I found here. And, and I'm excited. I've been pumped up all week to share God's word with you. And I just hope that you're as excited to hear God's word as I am to preach God's word, okay? You could get me fired up a little bit if you would just say, yeah, like, like in a good, like, yeah, fired up way, right? Okay. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So let's start, let's start by reading Acts chapter 3. We're going to start there in verse 12. So, so what happens, of course, the guy from last week, you remember that guy who was lame for for 40 plus years, they go to the temple and they inject Jesus into the situation and this guy's been lame for 40 years and all of a sudden he jumps up and he's healed and he's, and he's jumping up and down and he's praising God and he goes in the temple and he's an outcast, now he's, he's in the in crowd and, and he's worshiping God, he's totally healed and everyone's like absolutely astounded it says and then so here we are in chapter 3 verse 12. So Peter saw his opportunity And addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though he has, we have, we had made, I'm super excited, okay. We had made this man walk by our own power or godliness. For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. So Pilate, the guy in charge with the Roman governor, he's like, this guy didn't do anything wrong. Let him go. Makes sense, right? But Pilate chose to release him. But you rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. It just shows up how, just like, like right there, I find like that's an example of how jacked up we are as people. Like, we, we let go the perfect awesome dude to release the worst dude. That just, it's just, I don't know if it speaks to you, but it speaks to me of the condition of the human race. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. I love that. Fact! Exclamation mark. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed, and and you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. That's a great place for an amen. You know what's awesome? Let me break for a second. Time out. So I was reading this, right? How many people honestly think, just honesty in church, how many people think that they're like, they're so wretched that there's just really no reason why Jesus would forgive them. Honestly. Like, I've done so much, right? And I'm, like, I'm that guy. Like, I know he has. It's awesome. But you just feel like I'm just, I'm beyond repair, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but listen, 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 listen. You know, we always talk about the worst guy ever was Paul because he was killing Christians. This guy, Peter, is actually talking to the people who killed Jesus. And he told the people who literally put the hammer to the spike that you can repent too and be forgiven of your sin. Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. Like maybe there's some hope for you after all, right? Times of refreshment in the presence of God. Even those who literally did the murdering. Makes you feel a little bit better than maybe I'm not that bad, right? Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. And he will, this is going to be a great place for an amen too. You ready? Are you guys ready for it? Don't jump the gun, guy. (laughs) Times of refreshment will come in the presence of the Lord. And he will again send you Jesus. Your appointed Messiah. For he must remain in heaven until the time of the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me 
from among your own people. Listen carefully to everything he tells you. Then Moses said, anyone who will not listen to that prophet, who's he talking about? Come on. Yes. Who gets an A? Right there. Yes. Listen to all that Jesus says, or you'll be completely cut off from God's people. Yikes. Starting with Samuel, every prophet spoke about what is happening today. You are the children of those prophets, and you are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through your descendants, all the families on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first to the people of Israel to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. Okay, listen. Truth shared, example shown, right? Let's start with truth shared. Okay, jot this stuff down. Listen, I want you to take careful notes. Look, uh, let me tell you this too, okay? I am going to gorge you with the Bible today, okay? Not a whole lot of talking from your preacher, a lot of Bible. So listen, you know I usually put the Bible verses on the screen with the page? There'll be no page numbers. If we spend all the time going to those verses, we will be here literally, I will preach for three hours. And I don't want to do that to you, okay? We got fried chicken waiting. I understand that you need to get in there and eat, and I don't want you to start looking at me and thinking about a drumstick, okay? <laughs> so, so, so please, just do me a favor, okay? Please. When you see the verses on the screen, write the references down. And I want you to, this homework in church, okay? Nobody likes this. Don't be scared. I want you to go home and I want, you to, I want you to jot these verses down. I want you to go home and I want you to read them and I want you to prove me wrong. Okay? Test what I'm telling you. Don't, listen, it's not just your everyday life that's affected. It's your eternity. And so you're supposed to check the preacher. You're supposed to check the preacher, right? So write down the verses, go home and read them and see if what I'm teaching you is true because your, 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 your today and your forever is in the balance of all this stuff, okay? So please jot these things down, okay? Let's start with truth shared, okay? Uh, let's just call this a reminder. Look at verse 12, right? Look at verse 12. Uh, he says, what's so surprising about this? What's so surprising about this? This is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And, and so what it is here is Peter's doing this, 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 this wide call to everybody to remember all that God had done. This, this is not something new. Remember, remember, this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's, a, he's the one and, who spoke and the universe was formed. He, he's the one who made the sun stand still for Joshua. He's the one who opened the Red Sea for Moses. He's the one who fed his people with manna from heaven and quail from the sky and water from the rock. He's the one who sent fire down from heaven for Elijah. He's the one who raised the dead boy for Elisha. And he's the one who protected Daniel from the lion's dead. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are you so surprised? This is, this is what he does. This is who he is, right? God is a supernatural Miracle working God that creates. He creates things, right? And, and listen, you know where God does his best creation? Where there's nothing, right? When, 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 when there was nothing in this universe, the God of, of, of heaven and earth, the one that we, that we call Jesus, right? He, he spoke into the nothing and everything you see was there. Right? So if you're in a situation where you feel like there's no hope right, and no chance and no survival and no way, no means nothing to God. Okay? God creates in the nothing. Okay? Just know this. So when you feel hopeless and you feel like there's no chance of fixing the problem, that is when God steps in and creates. He provides when there's nothing, right? I got no food, God, manna. I got no food, God, quail. I got no drink, God, water, right? That's what he does. This is what he does. This is what he does. And he, listen, and he heals, right? He heals. So when the guy gets healed and they're all like, whoa. And Peter's like, why are you so surprised? Of course he heals. That's what he does, right? Where's Lori? Where's Lori this morning? You guys know what I'm talking about? Who was here for a prayer the other night? I'm going to share her testimony right now because she's not here. And she was open about it, so I'm going to talk about her boob. 
I don't care. She did, right? Is that okay? Is it okay to talk about her boob? She, had a, she said, told us she had a lump on her boob. You could just see it. You could feel it. You could play with it. The doctor said, no chance that's not cancer. We've got to go in there and do a biopsy. We've got to find out whether we can just take it out or if we need to do chemo and radiation, all that kind of stuff, right? It was, you could, you didn't just see it in a, ra- in a, in a what is that called? An x-ray, right? You play with it. That's how bad it was. And, and the doctor said, no chance. She saw, what, three, doc- three cancer doctors? No chance it's not cancer. No chance it's not cancer. No chance it's not cancer. She goes in to get biopsy. They go in. She looks over at the nurse. The nurse starts smiling. She's like, that's peculiar. And she looks over at the doctor. He starts smiling. He starts laughing. Well, she's like, what the hell's going on around here, man? <laughs> Why are they laughing at me, right? He's like, we can't find anything. It's gone. It's just gone. I don't even know. They, they, they can't explain it. The doctor's like, I don't know what's going on right here. I can't explain it. You know, she prayed, God, give me the strength to get through it. She didn't even ask for a healing. Give me the strength to get through it. Seek first my kingdom, he said, and all that you need shall be provided. Boom, his word is true. This is who God is, right? That's who he is. That's who he is. He is a, he is a creating, healing, providing, miracle-working God. And listen, you cannot command this of him, but you should, as his followers, expect it of him because that's who he is. That's his calling card, okay? That's who he is. So here's the second thing. First is reminder. Second one is rejected, right? Look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. You rejected This holy, righteous one instead demanded the release of a murderer. You rejected him. You handed him over, and and he was rejected before Pilate. Who who is this rejected one? Yes, he is is holy for sure, right? It says that right there. He is is holy. He is alone. He is set apart. We know that, right? Um, He said he is righteous. We certainly know he is righteous. Yes, he he is alone perfect. And, and listen, if that's all he was, holy and righteous, then he could be admired, he could be, re, he could be respected, and he certainly could be followed, right? But that's not enough, right? Peter clarifies. He, he's not just holy. He's not just righteous. No. You killed the author of life. He's the author of life, right? Not only should Jesus be admired and respected and followed as a man, but he should be worshipped as creator God. That's who he is, okay? That's who he is. John 1, verses 3 through 4, God created everything through Jesus Christ, and nothing was created except through him. The word, Jesus Christ, gave life to everything. What, What does that exclude? Nothing. Right? Nothing. He gave life to everything that was created. Colossians 1.16, my very, very, very favorite verse in all of Scripture. Everything was created by him and for him. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Through Jesus Christ, God created the universe. Okay? The truth is that Jesus Christ is more than a moral teacher or a prophet or a righteous dude, more than a baby in a manger who grew up and never got put in time out and then went to the cross to pay for your sin and mine. Jesus is the author of life. That's who he is. Okay? And listen, I don't think it's a theological stretch based on the word authorship, right? He's the author of life. Maybe you don't think about this, but I think about little things like this because they're big things to me. I believe that the universe wasn't just created by Jesus, but I think this whole thing was his idea, right? There's an architect and there's a builder, and he's both. He's both. It was his idea to make hearts beat, to make water flow, to make thoughts to know things, right? To planets to spin. <laughs> The ability for me to just utter these wacko sounds that are coming out of my mouth right now, right? And somehow you've been given these eardrums to hear these weird sounds coming out of my mouth. And somehow you can understand what I'm saying so that we can communicate. That was all thought up and created in the mind of Jesus Christ. That's incredible, right? That's who he is. He's the author of life. That's who the world rejects, the author of life. 
Why does the world reject him? It's the third thing. I'm just, gonna, I'm just rocking through these things, okay? Because I got a lot. Remember? Rejected? Third thing, reason. Why, why, why does the world reject him? Why does the world reject him? Look at verse 17. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. In ignorance, that's why. They're ignorant, right? Acts 17, we'll get to it in a few months or something. Paul says that people don't acknowledge the Lord because of ignorance. He says it again there, okay? Now listen, ignorance has a bad, a bad rap, okay? We, we use the word ignorance most often uh, in a negative way, okay? It, it's kind of a, it's not in the, in, the, in, the, in the dictionary this way, but it's sort of used as a synonym for kind of stupid or bad, right? You're ignorant. You know what I'm talking about? You're ignorant. And it's really not a negative. It's really not a demeaning term. It's actually just the lack of knowledge. It's just the lack of knowledge. And listen, I would just say, I would, I would just venture out into these waters right now. I'd say it's not them being stupid um, or, or uh, bad. I would say that it's, love you, us being stupid and bad, because if they have a lack of knowledge, it's because they haven't been told, right? Right? We were all ignorant at one time. Was that our, if you're ignorant, then you can't, it's almost like ignorance is bliss, you know what I mean? Like you can't blame the ignorant guy because he just doesn't know. Why doesn't he know? Because no one told the guy, right? No one, if you don't tell a dude to brush his teeth, he's not going to do it, right? That's why we tell our kids to brush their teeth. They don't just naturally wake up when they're four and go, you know what, I just want to brush my teeth now. It doesn't happen that way, right? They're ignorant. Does that mean they're bad or stupid? No, they've just never been told. It's just a lack of knowledge, right? And it's for this express reason why Jesus calls you and I, the ones who know, the ones who know the truth, to go and be faithful witnesses to the things we've been taught to the truth that we know. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, teach these truths to trustworthy men and women who will in turn share it with others, right? That's what we're supposed to do. And so here's the biblical plea for you. We could take this out of so many different places in the Bible, but I was led here. In Acts 2.21 and in Romans 10.13 says the same thing. It says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, that's great news for the not yet saved. So it's an open invite. Like, anyone, doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, it doesn't matter where you live, nothing disqualifies. If you say, Jesus, save me with any authenticity in your heart, he rushes in and you're saved. Like, that's an amazing truth for the unsaved. But, but listen, if you, if, if, you're not going to go there. But if you're looking in Romans chapter 10, you see that verse in verse 13, it says that. That's awesome news. But here's the truth. That's the truth for the unsaved. But here's the truth for you. Verses 14 and 15 says this. I'll read 13 first. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But, that's what it says, but... How can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him, right? Right? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone sends them? Right? So, so Jesus says in his most famous words, right? In, in, in the Great Commission, they call it. In Matthew chapter 28, what was it, 18, 19, 20? He says, now listen, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. So, listen, who's the boss? Jesus. It, no, you know what he's saying? No one can tell you otherwise. No one can tell you to stop. No one can tell you anything. If I say do it, there's no option, and there's no one who can overrule me. Do you agree? All authority. I am the boss. Now go make disciples of all people. That's what he said. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have taught 
You. Right? How will they know unless they hear? How will they believe in him unless they've been told? And how will they be told unless someone is sent? Raise your hand if you've been sent. Every single person in this room, if you're a Christian, has been sent. You just heard it out of the words. Those are the, those are the words of Jesus. Right? Everyone. I ask you again. How many people in this room have been sent? Show your hands, right? You've been sent. You've been sent. Loved ones, don't take that lightly. To those, much is given, much is required. You've been sent. You've been sent. And all authority is Jesus Christ, and he sent you. So let me just turn the screws a little bit. How much right do you have to say no to him? How, how much right do you have to sit on your blessed assurance and not tell anybody about him? Exactly. Show me. Exactly. Zero chance. You have no right, no right, no right. You know why? Because you're not your own anymore. You've been bought. The high price of the blood of Jesus Christ, you are now owned. That's a blessed ownership, though, isn't it? That's a good ownership. I'm happy to be owned. I'm happy to be a slave of Christ. I am. I hope that you are as well. Right? Yeah. You could, if you're going to clap in this church, we do it. We don't just think about it. Right? You do it. All right, here's, the fourth, here's the fourth truth, right? right? Reminder, rejected, reason. Fourth thing has four things. Repent, return, refresh, return. Bunch of R's, right? I think that's cute. I mean, it doesn't, I don't know if it has any redemptive value. That's another R, by the way, redemptive value. All R's, right? Repent, return. Refresh, return. It says right there that Jesus the Messiah had to suffer these things, right? He had to suffer all these things for our sin. And the truth of this suffering demands, here's another R, a response. A response, right? So if we're back in the book of Acts, what, look at verse 19. What does it say? All these things, all these things, all these things. He's, he died Verse 19, now repent of your sins and turn to God. Amen. What's repent? Repent is, is, is something we need to talk more about in church. Repent means before you go sobbing on your knees and say, I'm sorry, right? First you acknowledge that God is right about everything right about everything first you acknowledge that God is right about everything and you acknowledge also that the way you've been living and thinking and speaking and going and doing and prioritizing and perspective and all those things if you're on track at all you were just like I hate to use this word in church you were just lucky to get there right because we're broken bent people so we acknowledge that God is right about everything and that we just off we're just wrong, right? That's just who we are. He's perfect. He's right. His word is true. I'm not, right? That, that's, that's what repenting is, right? But then it also says, and turn to God, right? It says, acknowledge and then apologize. Like, hey, God, I'm sorry. Like, I didn't realize, right? Lack of knowledge. I was ignorant. There was a time I was totally ignorant. Anybody? Totally ignorant, right? I was doing everything wrong because nobody in 30 years in suburban America ever told me about Jesus. I had no clue. Why do you think I did the stuff that I did? I was ignorant, right? And then someone finally introduced me to God's word and Jesus and was like, ah, this is awesome, right? This is awesome. I can't believe everything. That, and I realized not only... Somewhere along the line did I realize, not only is this awesome, but I started reading, I'm like, yeah, I totally am jacked up. What's wrong with me? Right? We're all like that. Everybody's got that story, right? I just didn't know. I didn't know. And so, so we, we acknowledge that he is right about everything, and we're wrong about everything, and we apologize. God, I'm sorry. I, I'm so, please forgive me of this. Please forgive me of what I did. I didn't know. But thank you for letting me know. And then return, right? The Bible says that we are made in his image to be like him. Now let's just be honest in church. Mirror time. How many in this room can truly say, even now saved, that you like him? 
Come on. No, 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 not that you like him, that you're like him. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So originally God makes us, right, and he goes, this is really good, right? Now when he sees Jesus on you, this is good. But without Jesus, he's probably going, yeah, I don't know, man. (laughs) It was good. (laughs) What's going on here, right? So we acknowledge that we've failed, and then we made in his image to be like him, but we all stray. And so the call here in the text is, is acknowledge, apologize, and return, right? Return. Isaiah 53, 6 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. Romans chapter 3 says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standards. So the call is return. Return. Why? Just keep reading. Just keep reading. Repent and turn to God. Why? So that your sins may be wiped away. So that your sins may be wiped away. Right? If you don't circle 1 John 1, 9, 27 times in your Bible and highlight it, reach over to the guy next to you's Bible and highlight it in their Bible. <laughs> right? Reach into your mom's notes over there, man, and write, write it down for her. She needs this. 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all your wicked unrighteousness. Right? So, rem- you know all, that, you know all that, that crap you pulled? Remember all that stuff? Right? Right? Now the ghost is living in you, right? And you kind of feel bad about what you did? Who feels bad about what they did? Why? You shouldn't. You've been cleansed of that. Don't feel bad about it anymore, right? If you are confessing your sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you. Why is it in there anymore? Get rid of that stuff. Don't raise your hand anymore for that stuff, right? If it's been cleansed, it's gone. You know, all that shame and guilt and I can't believe I did that, done. That's condemnation. Listen, if it's been forgiven, why do you feel so bad about it now? Not to say that what you did was right. It's still wrong. We're not condoning sin. But what I'm saying is, if he literally has wiped your sins away, like it says, why are you still dwelling there? Get out of your pit, right? Your eyes are on the sin instead of on the sun. I just got that one. Now watch this, right? So your sins may be wiped away. Verse 20. Then times of refreshment will come. Refreshment. The t- times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. Psalm 116, I mean, sorry, Psalm 1611 says this. In your presence is fullness of joy. Isn't that awesome? But listen, listen, you can read that. You know what? I think I know why there wasn't a whole lot of amens. Because, listen. It's true, but it doesn't always feel that way, right? Because you, you, you hear the verse, you're like, it, you, I know that God's word is true, yeah, but I don't experience that all the time. It's not always full joy in the presence of God, right? Because right? when you're doing naughty stuff, it's like, right? You kind of don't want God right there when you're doing that stuff, right? I don't want my dad watching me while I'm misbehaving. I know he loves me but I just really don't want him here when I'm doing that. So so we understand that there's fullness of joy in his presence, but we don't always feel it. But when your past has been dealt with, right, and it's been cleansed from you, and when sin isn't being practiced anymore, and and you're walking in obedience to God's word, then when you walk into God's house and the preacher starts preaching God's words, you don't feel condemned and rebuked. No, you feel encouraged and refreshed, and you get out of boys and out of girls, and hey, that's really awesome. Keep it up. You get refreshed. That's my girl. 
Look at her giving generously. Look at her bringing people into her home and, and, and sharing meals with joy and generosity. That's, that's my girl, not, I don't do that. <laughs> Repent, return, refresh, and then here's another return, right? Verse 20. Just keep reading. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and, like, if that's not good enough, right? And he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. So Jesus has ascended, but one day he'll return. John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3 says, I am, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, I will come and get you so you will always be with me. The return of Jesus Christ is the great hope of the church. It's when all the wrongs that you see that you mean, I want justice and I can't believe they get away with that and this is wrong. All that stuff is made right. And there's, a, there's finally eternal peace and joy forever. Amen? Amen. Right? These, these things, these four things are truths that are shared in Acts chapter 3 by Peter and we need to grab a hold of every single one of them. We need those. Those are truths that have been shared, okay? And let them encourage you today. So to know them, though, is good, but what you do with them, that is crucial, okay? So remember, we, we have to share the truth that they shared by following the example that they show so we could see the results that we want to see, okay? So that's truth shared, right? Here's example Shown, jot this down, example shown, example shown. I got all this truth now. I'm loaded down with truth, God. Now what? Now what? Now is the time we stop listening and we start doing something with it, right? We start doing something with it. By the way, don't ever stop listening. Scratch that. I hope my point's made, though. Okay? First thing. You'll see it in the text. not making anything up. Christians should be ready opportunistic people, opportunistic people. Peter wrote a book uh, towards the end of the Bible, there's a couple of little short letter there, and it's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where he says, always be ready to explain your hope, right? Always be ready to explain your hope. I think, this is not biblical, this is just me, I think he wrote that because it was based on what happened right here. I think his experience right here and the awesome result of it prompted him to write, always be ready to tell people about your hope. Always tell people, okay? Be on the lookout for these divine encounters, right? Be on the lookout for these divine opportunities. Look for the ripe fruit to be picked. Look for hopeless situations that would breathe new life if Jesus got involved, okay? We have to be looking for those things all the time. You see it right there at the beginning of what we read. He saw his opportunity, right? He, Peter saw the opportunity. Why? Because he was looking for it. He was looking for it. Lifestyle evangelism is a big thing in our world. And I'd say that it's very good for people to see you living out the gospel. For sure. Would you agree? But would you agree that that just ain't going to get it? Okay? It's just not going to get it. Let me tell you what I mean. God moved powerfully in the temple, lame guy, 40 years, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk, right? God moved powerfully, and Peter seized the opportunity that, that God created to explain the creator. You have to get this. You have to look for these opportunities. God moves, but you have to seize the opportunities to tell people, right? You have to tell people about what's going on. There's another amazing story in the Bible. It's just the same thing, same thing again. It's, it's over in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, but Isaiah chapter 6, it tells of this vision that the prophet Isaiah had where he saw the Lord. He saw the Lord, and listen, when he saw the Lord, he was undone, right? He's like, I'm done. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. 
And I live with people of unclean lips, right? In other words, what does this mean? We're filthy, we're bad, we're wrong, we do stuff wrong, we think things wrong, we're doing wrong, we're sinful people, right? He admits it. His, God's holiness in front of him made him painfully aware of his unholiness and his unrighteousness and his sin and his failure, right? If you read the story, the moment he realizes how holy the Lord is and how unholy he is, an angel of the Lord goes over to the altar and he picks up a piece of burning coal and he puts it on Isaiah's mouth. Listen to what it says. Then one of the seraphim, that's the angel, flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. I heard it said recently, uh, did the angel steal the coal? Or, like he's right in the pre- he's in the throne room, y'all. So so so, do you think he did it on his own? I think God told him to do it. I think he commanded his angel, go get that and do this. Watch this. He flew over. He had taken a piece of burning coal. He had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, "See, this coal has touched your lips." Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Right? Awesome, right? And that's our image. That's for us, right? You've been forgiven, you've been forgiven, you've been forgiven, you've been cleansed. Now watch. Then I heard the Lord asking, now that he's cleansed, now that he's forgiven, what does the Lord say? I heard him. Whom shall I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go for us? And, and, I, and, and what does Isaiah say? Me. Send me. So before he was like, I'm undone. I can't, I'm just awful. I'm terrible. You're awesome. Now he's like, send me. Oh, me, me, me. Why? Because he's been forgiven and cleansed of his sin. Send me. Send me. Right? That's us. Send me. It, it's not just a lifestyle. It's you got to open up your mouth and you got to tell someone about this. Send me, Lord. Send me. I'll be your messenger, God. I'll tell people about you, God. You have to be ready and looking for opportunities. You have to be intentional. You have to be actively, on purpose, on mission, looking for opportunities to open your mouth and tell people about Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done for you, right? That's the posture for us all the time. Always be looking. When you leave here today, get out of the little holy church and go out there with the unholy and go find, look for opportunities. Look for the people whose life is trashed and breathe new life into it, just like the lame man at the temple. 40 years, total miserable life. And those people, look, they saw an opportunity. You know what? I don't have much, but I got this. In Jesus' name, stand up and walk. And it changed the whole village. And because of it, it changed you. Because you're here because that happened. Right? Right? Thousands of years later, the world has changed because this man opened his mouth. So, first thing, you have to be ready and opportunistic people. Here's the second thing. That's very cute right there. God's witnesses are humble. Okay? Not only are they ready and opportunistic people, but they are humble people. Look what it says right there. We didn't do this. We, we, we didn't do anything. Who were we? We didn't do anything. It was Jesus. It was, it was God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who, who brought glory to his son Jesus. It wasn't me. It wasn't me, right? Faithful servants, leaders in the church of Jesus Christ all throughout the Bible, and if they're legit today, they'll be the same way, right? They're always putting themselves down low. Me nothing, me nothing, him everything, right? All throughout the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is awesome. We are pre- uh, Paul, talk about, hey, um, some people follow Paul. I mean, some people follow, follow Peter, some follow Apollos, and some follow Paul. And he's like, who are we? We're just God's workers. We're just, all of us are just doing his work. You know, one of us would plant the seed of the word of God in you, tell you the first time. And then someone else will come along, one of these guys, maybe it's Apollos. He'll come in and he'll share something that'll water that seed. And then maybe someone else will come along and he'll water it again. But it's God who brings the increase. 
It's God who saves. It's God who transforms the heart. It's God who brings you to a place of awareness of, of your great sin and your great need for him and the help that's found in Christ and Christ alone. It's God who does this. It's not me. Acts chapter 14, same thing. You see a story there about Paul and Barnabas. They go to these people. They're performing their miracles. They're preaching, right? And the people start to worship them. They're like bowing down to these guys. And, the, and you can see the story. Paul and Barnabas like reached down and grabbed, no, 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 get up. What are you doing? What are you doing worshiping me? I'm, I'm no different than you. I'm just, I'm just a worker bee, man. Don't worship me. Worship him. Worship him. Proverbs 3.34 says that the Lord opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And over in the New Testament, just so we know that it's one word, one book, one God, James says in chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, listen, he repeats the same verse from Proverbs. The Lord opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. But then he also adds this little directive at the end. So humble yourselves before God. And that's not for the people in the pews. That's for the people standing right here. Humble yourselves before God. I believe, and I think the Bible tells this story, and history tells this story, that the gospel spreads most effectively through men and women both that don't desire attention or praise. They don't throw around titles or position ever. I want no credit ever for anything, right? Jesus says in Luke chapter 17 that if, if we are obedient to him, and it doesn't make any difference if you're the newest convert who just came to Christ this afternoon or the, or the one who's been up there leading a church of 20,000 people for the last 40 years. It doesn't make any difference. If you obey Jesus, he says do something and you do it. You are not seeking praise. You're not to be praised. You're simply to say, I am an unworthy servant simply doing my duty. Period. Right? And the greatest in the church will be the least, will be the one who can say with total sincerity and authenticity, I am nothing, and you are every single thing. I heard it said best this way, that any effective Christian minister, male or female, is nothing more than a tour guide that takes you to and points your eyes at God, not at them, okay? That's what a minister of the gospel should be, okay? Humble. That means ready, humble, and then this. God's witnesses should be bold, should be bold, okay? Much about this matter of boldness was preached uh, two weeks ago. And you can go to our Facebook page or our YouTube channel, and you can see all about that uh, in detail. But... When God puts this topic, or any topic, if you will, in the scriptures again and again and again, it's not to be ignored because it's obvious that God believes that certain things are only accomplished by way of reminder, right? We need to be reminded of these things, right? How many people felt um, a little refreshed when we shared a, a few moments ago that if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to, to forgive you and to cleanse you of all the unrighteousness, right? Did you feel a little bit refreshed anew? But you knew it already, but you just need to be reminded of it again, right? It's just that truth reminded over and over and over again. How many people just need to hear today that, that, so, that God so loved the world that he gave his son so whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life? It's refreshing to hear that, right? How many people didn't know that before they came in? Right. But you hear it again and again and again because we need to be reminded. And so we need to be reminded over and over again to be bold with the gospel. Look at, look at Peter here, right? The coward who cowered like a little baby when, when Jesus was arrested and they said, I know, aren't you one of, no, I don't know him. Chicken, right? But, but look here. People of Israel, think about this for a second. They're all crowded into the temple, so he's in a setting kind of like this. People, right? 
And he stands up and says, can I get your attention, please? That's what he's saying there, right? Can I get your attention, please? Bold, right? Very bold. Let's just reread just a few verses here. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate. Despite Pilate's decision to release him, you rejected this holy and righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses to this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name, in case they hadn't heard it yet. He's really digging in the Jesus thing here, right? He's, just not, he's not saying God did it. God did it. God did it, right? The generic term. God did it. God, everybody out there has a God. Right? Everybody thinks their God's number one God, right? Everybody's got the, a God, but these guys are very specific, right? It wasn't just faith in God, no. Faith in the name of Jesus. That's how he got healed, right? And, and you did this stuff out of ignorance. Bold, right? Bold. Clear, simple truth spoken in spite of possible bad outcome. That's boldness. These people had just killed Jesus Christ. So don't you think there was a part of Peter that's saying, if I preach Jesus, they're going to kill me too. Now we know that that wasn't the case. We see the story unfold and we can watch it and we know there's Acts chapter 3, 4, and 5. We get all that. But in the moment, right, they had, he's talking to the ones who actually killed him. He came preaching a the kingdom. They killed him. And Peter steps up. Listen, can I get all of your attention, please? Hush, hush, hold up. Look, eyes up here. You killed Jesus and he's the Lord. Right? He's thinking, man, I'm going to get killed. But yet, clear, simple truth proclaimed in that moment in spite of possible adversity, persecution, martyr, whatever could happen, he still does it. And it's that type of bold preaching that spreads the gospel to the ends of the earth. It will never be done through cowardice. Never. And the world that we live in is trying to make you be quiet. And the answer to the world's problem is not to vote for Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden. You could pick whoever you want. I don't care. That's not the solution to problem. You might think Donald Trump's God's guy. You might think that Biden's God's guy. Listen, now's not a place to give your opinion. Do it at the polls, not at the pulpit, please. That's not the solution to the problem. None of them can take away the world's sin. Okay, Jesus is the solution. And we can't be quiet about the solution that we know is right and effective and hope that a government is going to fix things. The reason why the government steps in in so many areas is because we are weak and pathetic. That's why. So we need to speak up about what the truth is, because people are what? They're ignorant. They're not stupid. They're not bad. They're ignorant. If you've been given the truth and you have the solution to the problem, open your mouth and let it be known, right? Because otherwise, it's not going to get better. It's just going to get worse. It's just going to get worse. So... Clear, simple truth proclaimed in the face of adversity. God's witnesses need to be bold, okay? Jesus said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth, and they need to be bold. And I know some people have come to this church and left because they think I'm too bold. And I don't care. Because I'm looking, at, right, I'm looking at Peter. He was way more bold than me. And from what I read just a chapter ago, he led 3,000 people to Jesus. So, so, so who cares about being too bold, right? Be more bold. 
Maybe it's just that we're cowards and we're not bold enough. Maybe there's not enough of this hard, in-your-face, punch-in-the-face truth preaching that people need. Right? It, it worked for Peter. He didn't come out and like sugarcoat and, well, maybe you, you know, you could be a, 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 a better dean. No, no, no. You need to repent of your sin and bow to Jesus, right? Boom! Right? That's what you need to do. That's what really spreads the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? We need to be, we need to be bold. We need to be bold, okay? Too much for, let's just get over the not being bold thing anymore, right? We got to be bold, okay? Now, here's, here's, here's the last thing. Got to be ready. You got to be humble. You got to be bold. And you got to have faith. You got to have faith. Now listen, this, this, I saved this one for last. This is a very controversial word. It's a very controversial word in the church, right? I hope that I can clarify some things for you this morning so you have a proper perspective on what faith is, okay? The reason why I want to clarify it a little bit is because I don't know if you guys have ever been in a situation where you prayed for something and it doesn't happen and someone comes up to you and says it didn't happen because you didn't have enough faith. Anybody? Didn't have enough faith to be healed. Didn't have enough faith to prosper. Didn't have, have a faith to be saved. Didn't have a faith for this. Didn't have enough faith for that. You got to have more faith if you want to be blessed. Yeah, that's awesome, except it's bad theology. Um, do me a favor. Now, this is important. You need to go the, to the Bible, okay? Look in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Please look. Please look there. Like, this is super important. Because I think what happens is, is that that with good intention, I don't think false teachers, I mean, there's some people that are just downright wolves sent from hell. Like, I get that. But I think a lot of people, and I'm sure myself too, and you might not like when I say this, but I'm sure there's times that I've been a false teacher too, and it's not because I was evil, it's just because I made a mistake. Don't we all make mistakes? I make mistakes. We all make mistakes, right? I'm not Jesus. Are you Jesus? You're not Jesus. We make mistakes, right? So, so I think a lot of people just make some mistakes, and so when they tell you, well, you didn't have enough faith, I think that they want to try to encourage you, but it's just bad theology because what happens is, is you walk away from the situation. You walk away from the church with no hope that maybe God doesn't love you, that I, I'm not quite there. What's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith, here it is, God has given you, okay? So that's why it says, don't think you're better than you really are. Like, have an honest assessment. What he's telling us here is, listen, you can't, you can't create your own faith. Like you, so when someone says, you didn't have enough faith, just, just, just have more faith. Okay. I'd love to have more faith. I'm given all I got. God gives you the faith, right? So any, any ounce of faith that you have, any ounce of trust you have in him, it's because God put it in there. You didn't create it. So that's why, that's why Paul's telling, like, have an honest assessment of yourself. Like, you're not God, y'all. But when you have an honest assessment of yourself, you can have peace in who you are. When you know who you are and you know who God is, you know your roles and you can live in peace there. But when you're trying to be God and you're trying to flex your God muscles and you don't have any, that's discouraging. Conjure up more faith. Create more faith. Have more faith. I can't have more faith. I want more faith. I can't. Listen, God gives the faith. Okay? God gives the faith. He does it two ways that I know of in Scripture. Maybe I'm missing one, but here's two. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the word of God, okay? Faith comes from hearing the word of God. Did you know that your faith has increased today? Did you know that? Did you know that? Okay, every single time you open up your Bible, every single time you come to God's church and someone's proclaiming the word of God over you, in that environment where you're hearing the word of God, entering your ears and into your mind, into your heart, he's, he's using that to build your faith and trust in him, okay? That's what happens so that's one way. Here's a second way, 1 Corinthians 12, 9. The Spirit gives great faith to some, right? So there's two ways. So it's either a, over time, it's growing and growing and growing and increasing more and more every day by hearing the Word of God, reading the Word of God, having the Word of God proclaimed over you over and over and over again. 
Faith is increasing every single time you do it. Or God just goes, boop. I'd take the boop. But it doesn't always happen. Boop, like that, right? It doesn't happen that way. But I wouldn't discount this, though. That maybe the boop still comes from hearing over and over and over again. But maybe, just saying, I don't know. It's not the Bible. It's just me. Maybe the boop supernatural gift of great faith is a result of you spending time hearing the word of God, studying the word of God, right? But God has given you a little bit more of a faith from reading it than the next guy. I, I don't know. I'm just saying that there's two ways. Faith comes from hearing. Sometimes, what does he do? Boop, right? Boop, supernatural gift, right? So, here, all that to say this. How, how much, so, so there's this lame guy, right, at the temple. How much faith did he have? From all I could see, none. He didn't even know who this dude was, right? He may have heard of Jesus, because Jesus was kind of a rock star back then now, right? Right? You think that, that Kanye is making a wave, right? So, so Jesus is going around, right? Kanye is just talking about Jesus. Jesus is Jesus, right? So he's doing all this crazy stuff, right? So probably pretty popular around town. But, but who are these guys? Peter and John? Nobody's, right? So they walk up to this guy. This guy is simply there in the temple just trying to get a coin for the day just so he could eat. He's got no, no evidence of faith in Jesus Christ at all. If he does, God didn't put it in the Bible. So I see no evidence of faith at all. The faith was in Peter. God had given Peter the faith to believe that if he looked at that guy and said, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk, that Jesus would do it. God had given him the faith to trust that if I say this, it's going to happen. And God honored that, and he did. Right? That guy had no faith, but Peter had the faith. Faith is the confident assurance that what we hope for will actually happen. Okay? God puts that trust in you. You're not qualified, as Romans 12, 3 would say. You're not qualified to, to create faith, to conjure it up more, right? To increase your faith. Now, don't hear me saying that with faith that it's getting done. Okay, that's not what I'm saying, and it's not what the Bible's saying. What the Bible would say in Mark 9, 23 is that all things are possible to him who has faith, okay? Some translations would say those who believe, but I looked it up, and it's the same Greek word, okay? So all things are not definite. All things are what? Possible to someone who has faith. Conf faith is confident trust, not definite trust, right? It's confident trust trust okay so let's just end this here okay let's just end this here an effective witness that pushes the kingdom forward has confident trust that Jesus is Lord that his word is true and that preaching Jesus and praying in the name of Jesus will produce kingdom results so loved ones, go forth from this place today with the faith God gave you in him and boldly tell of this Jesus, our creator and our savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you dearly for your word. I thank you, God, that the truths of who you are are so easily accessible to all of us in your word your word is not difficult to understand it is just easily avoided and that we want to stop we want to read it and do it 
God, your, your gospel and your kingdom not reaching the ends of the earth is not for a lack of power, not for a lack of truth, but for a lack of mobility. It's us. Perhaps, loved one, you could not listen to your preacher right now and have a conversation with the Lord. For you've been sent, loved one. This is not condemnation if you have not been an effective messenger yet. This is an encouragement from the Lord he says he loves you right we know that he says he loves you and then he sends you if you've embraced Jesus Christ by faith as Lord and Savior then your sins are forgiven and the Lord would say whom shall we send would it be you would it be you who raises their hand and says, here I am, Lord, send me. God, we have a monumental task before us to reach the ends of the earth with the good news and the saving grace of Jesus Christ the Lord. And for those of us that have embraced him now as Lord and Savior, we rejoice in this fact. We rejoice in and our saved status now. We're, we're thrilled and thankful that you saved us and came down from your throne and became sin so that we who are in you could become the righteousness of God. Now send me. Send me afresh, Lord. Send me to be more bold. But in my boldness, let me be humble before you, realizing that it's just my duty to be your messenger, but it is you who transforms a life. Lord, you've placed us here. You established this church right here in this community to reach these people with your message. We are not lost on the fact that it is through our giving where this message can go powerfully. You placed us here for this purpose. And so, Lord, I would ask right now, that you would speak to your people, that you've gathered here in your house to receive your message of go. And you'd speak to them on what they should do when it comes to giving. So your message could reach more. So God, we're going to give you space for just a moment or so and let you speak to your people. So all those with ears to hear, Listen to what the Lord says to you. And then there'll be some gentlemen who'll come through the room with a basket. There's boxes on the walls. There's a giving kiosk in the lobby. You give according to what God leads you to give. So we're listening, Lord.